Hi, welcome back to Kirstie's Virtual Classroom. Today we are talking about environmental policy. So we have something called common law and statutory law. So common law is where court-based decisions provide right and wrong answers. So this was very common um, before 1970. There weren't as many laws written, so usually a judge and lawyers would kind of decide what was right and wrong. Um, but then after 1970, we see statutory law, which is where we have written laws by the government to strengthen regulations. So um, a lot of people think that regulations are a lot stricter today than they used to be, and that's because prior to 1970, most of our <clears throat> laws and regulations were based off of common law, where it was decided per court case, um, instead of there being sort of a standard for um, particular regulations or particular laws specifically for the environment. So in 1969, an oil company dumped 100,000 barrels of crude oil into the Pacific Ocean off the coast of Santa Barbara. Um, this killed and threatened a lot of ocean life. Um, so this was one of the really big things um, that happened right before the EPA was founded in 1970. Um, so this, along with the a river in Ohio that was consistently polluted with oil was often catching fire, which was also killing the um, animal life in the river. So both of those instances were huge red flags and they led to kind of trying to work more on these regulations and get laws in place so that companies and people couldn't do this anymore or they would be fined or, you know, there would be some sort of... Um, consequence to how they were treating the environment. So in the 60s and 70s, there was a public outcry for the environment. So a lot of people um, were very much more conscious of what is impacting the environment, um, the pollution that they're seeing, and it skyrocketed in the 60s and 70s especially. Um, there were a lot more cars on the road, which as we all know, are very, um, dirty as far as air pollution goes. Um, they put a lot of um, CO2 and other bad components into the air that we in turn breathe in. Um, so it was said that in the 60s and 70s is when the destruction of the air um, started um, and it's just gotten worse. And luckily today we have a lot more things like electric cars, um, cleaner burning fuel, um, things like that, but it's still not, you know, where we would like it. So the, the public demanded answers and there were protests. Um, most of these people were not necessarily environmental scientists, they were environmentalists, but um, they had a similar um, agenda as environmental scientists would, um, just trying to clean up the air and trying to have some sort of regulations and some sort of justice for the environment. So in 1970, was when the EPA was founded and we had our first Earth Day, April 22nd of 1970. Um, this is where everybody that believes in the environment and wants a better environment to live in for humans and all life will celebrate the Earth, basically. Um, so if you have children, maybe you have done this where you've done an Earth Day at their school or maybe you've done it on your own where you take them to um, a camp. We used to run camps when we were open um, at Fresno State and sometimes at Fresno City. We would um, host grade school kids and do Earth Day activities with them. And I'd have other geologists with me um, teaching kids about Earth, um, just different topics. And it's kind of a fun day and you can make it a fun day. Um, this year, me and my daughter did some stuff when we were in quarantine. Um, and then we wrote some fun stuff out on the sidewalk about the Earth. And then I left rocks out for the neighbors if they wanted rocks on their walk. Um, and then December 1970 was when the EPA was finally signed into law by um, President Nixon. And this is kind of the regulatory figurehead for any environmental issue. So this is a federal <clears throat> agency. So this covers the entire United States. And then we'll talk a little bit more about what kind of regulations and what regulators we see in our particular states and region. So this was previously regulated by the Department of Agriculture, um, but now it's kind of its own figurehead so that it has its own agenda instead of agriculture having some say in it. Because obviously agriculture doesn't necessarily have 
um, the environment at the forefront of their agenda, if that makes sense, um, because their primary purpose is to provide crops and um, food for the United States. Um, and then in 1963, we see the Clean Air Act, and this is um, for primary and secondary air quality standards. And then, like I said, within each state, we have different um, regulations and implementation plans. Um, California has one of the higher standards for clean air and clean water. So um, we do live in a state that is very environmentally conscious, especially in their regulations. So a lot of people are not exactly always happy about that, but it does uh, do us a service in that our air is has more attention to being clean and our water has more attention to being clean. I'm not going to say that our air is cleaner because we have high density uh, populated areas, especially in basins where um, smog as if you grew up in the Central Valley, you know that smog accumulates in this area. Um, so it's not necessarily that our air is cleaner. We just have higher standards for our air and we're always trying to clean it up. Whereas some other states don't necessarily implement it as strictly. So this would set limits on a kind of federal level um, to reduce the mobile source of air pollution and ambient air quality standards. And then we have the uh, Wilderness Act in 1964. This allowed Congress to set aside federally owned land for preservation. So this is to try to help um, the ecosystems that were impacted by human activities to kind of reset and try to be preserved and so that some of those, that wildlife could come back um, because we had lost, I don't know if you'll remember there, I think in like the early like 90s, 2000s, we saw a lot of species um, start showing up on the endangered species list that weren't necessarily there before. Um, some of those have come back um, and kind of repopulated and some are still on the endangered species list. Um, so we want to preserve the wilderness as best we can. Um, especially if they're on public lands. So you'll see a lot of areas that are national forests. We've got the national park um, system. And then we also see the wilderness system. So those are all trying to preserve some of the natural beauty and natural habitats of different species. Um, then we have the Solid Waste Disposal Act of 1965. Um, this is when we were trying to find more efficient ways to dispose of solid waste. This promotes shredding and separation of waste burning um, remaining materials, and then promotes recycling. So the big thing that comes out of this is the recycle bins, right? Um, thing, the thing that's going to come next is more of the composting, right? So in 65, they started moving towards recycling plastic, glass, cardboard, um, all of those things instead of throwing them in the dump. Um, there are still things that go to our landfills. Obviously, anything that you throw in your trash can ends up in the landfill. Um, but if you're anything like me, you might be ordering a lot from Amazon these days instead of going to the store. So you have a lot of extra boxes. Um, all of those boxes should be going into your blue recycle bin um, because they can be reused. Um, so I fill up my recycle bin just as quickly as I fill up my trash bin. So um, that should be common in most households nowadays um, because there are so many recyclable materials being used. And then we have the Federal Water Pollution Control Act in 1965. Um, this is where we try to control <clears throat> the pollution um, in our public waterways. So this is not just surface water, it's also um, groundwater. So anything, any water that can be used for consumption basically falls under this. Okay, so this basically authorized the Surgeon General of the Public Health Service to prepare comprehensive programs for eliminated or reducing the pollution of interstate waters, tributaries, and improving sanitary condition of surface and underground waters. Basically, any water um, is falls under this. So this is really good because people were starting to drink stuff that they should not be drinking. Um, there are people that drank highly contaminated water in Fresno um, in the 20s to 50s. 1920 to 1950, um, when we had really big industry boom, and then it polluted the groundwater um, significantly. Um, and I spent the first six or so 
uh, years as a geologist working with a company trying to clean up a huge contamination plume um, in northwest Fresno. And it's still not, it's, it's under control. Um, and it is, when groundwater is pulled in that area, it is treated, but um, it had a significant, you know, kind of impact on what was spent over there, how the water was, um, you know, collected and treated. Um, so this had an impact on those kinds of things. All right, so then in 1968, we see the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. And so this is to help preserve specific rivers. Um, so there were rivers that were selected in the United States for preservation um, so that they could um, hold their remarkable scenic, recreation, geologic fish and wildlife, historic culture, or some other value that they have. Um, so this was to try to not just protect them from pollution, but also to try to protect their, um, you know, scenic views, or maybe they're really great for recreation. Maybe they have some geologic significance. Um, they have some sort of value to them that um, Congress wanted to see preserved. Then we have the EPA, which is the National Environmental Policy Act, 1970. Um, so this was big because it authorized Council on Environmental Quality as Oversight Board for General Conditions. It directs federal agencies to take environmental consequences into account on decision making, and it requires environmental impact reports to be made um, on every major federal product <laughs> or project. Excuse me. So um, de non-dependent on what you're doing with your federally funded project. Um, there has to be some sort of environmental impact study. Um, so like the high speed rail, that is a huge project in the state of California. And it does have federal monies coming in. Um, and they had so many environmental um, impact studies done prior to even breaking ground, um, prior to even making the plans to break ground. So um, the EPA does help control or regulate um, a lot of those really big projects um, and then they kind of send you know their regulations down from there um, to figure out you know how states want to handle particular regulations so um, in California like I said I worked as a geologist most of our like maximum contaminant levels which is how high a particular contaminant can be in water air or soil um, most of ours in California were higher than the EPA standards were um, so we had to double check with a lot of different agencies in California and make sure that we were within basically their most strict regulations. Um, that way we could get, you know, closure on a site for a client. And we have the Endangered Species Act of 1973. Most of us are pretty familiar with this. And this is to protect species that are considered threatened or endangered. And then sometimes, I mean, some instances, depending on the species, we've seen um, humans actually step in to try to promote um, rebirth of that species and try to get them to increase in their population so that they do not disappear because of us. <laughs> and then we have the Safe Drinking Water Act of 1974. So this is setting standards specifically for drinking water quality. Um, so this is most of the stuff that I dealt with in industry is making sure that the drinking water quality was very high standard um, and in california and the fresno area the standards are so high that basically most of your contaminants that could cause any kind of life long or chronic illnesses um you they basically have to be zero so um the standards are super super high um for our area for drinking water quality specifically um, then we have the Toxic Substances Control Act of 1976. Um, so the EPA tracks about 75,000 chemicals that are produced or imported into the U.S. Um, and they are screened <clears throat> um, and they may require testing or reporting um, that may pose an environmental or human health hazard. Um, so this, this act actually helped us control chemicals that um, either natural or manufactured um, that may cause some sort of harm to um, air, soil, water. Those are the three basic that they would test. Um, and that in turn will help reduce the human health hazard. Then we see the Clean Water Act of 1977. So this regulates and enforces all of the discharge to water sources 
and wetland destruction or construction. So this is all U.S. waterways. So this is a big deal. For instance, um, in California, we have something called uh, the California um, Surface Water Quality Control. And um, we, well, I say we, <laughs> I am a storm water quality control um, practitioner and um, director. And that's a certification that allows you on like a construction site um, to re help regulate the water that leaves a construction site because construction sites, if you don't know this, um, they do use a lot of different chemicals. There's chemicals in the concrete they're using. There's chemicals in um, some of the bonds they use to hold things together. Um, so if uh, rainwater hits that and then leaves the site dirty and then takes that into one of our waterways, um, that can definitely impact our waterways and cause either an increase in turbidity or pH. Um, turbidity is the amount of little particulates you'll see in water. So if your water is not very clean, it has turbidity in it. Um, if it's cleaner and you can kind of see through it, then the turbidity is low. And so on the project out on uh, 180 and almost going to like Reedley, um, when they extended the freeway out there, they went through so many of these waterways. So we had a lot of different plans that we had to uh, regulate these different waterways, even when they didn't have hardly any water in them. Um, and when they were working in the water to build the bridges and things like that, um, I had to monitor every hour and the pH and turbidity of that water to make sure they were not impacting it. Um, so that kind of stuff comes from this Clean Water Act of 1977. Um, and then we have the Compre Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation Liability Act, or CERCLA, Superfund 1980. Um, and this is a federal authority for emergency response and cleanup of hazard substances that have been spilled, improperly disposed, or released into the environment. So all of the other ones are kind of more preventative. This one is a response to something that has already happened. So some sort of environmental impact that has already occurred and now is needing to be cleaned up, okay? In California, we have a lot of different agencies that regulate different things. So um, they're all linked here. If you're interested in any of them on the PowerPoint slides, you can um, click on these and then kind of check them out um, on your own time. In Fresno, here are some of the big hitters. We have the Regional Air Quality Control Board. We have the Regional Water Quality Control Board. We have Fresno County and the city of Fresno. All of those regulate projects in this area. Um, and hold them to a specific environmental standard. And then if you wanna see 40 years of Earth Day in five minutes, you can watch um, this video on your own. Um, it's uh, linked on the PowerPoint on Canvas. All right, that's it for environmental policy and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.